work encompasses graffiti, if you can visualize a spectrum from vandalism, chaos on one end to fine art on the other. And this session offers up an opportunity to talk about resistance and art on both ends of that spectrum. And so that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, just a quick outline of the presentation. I'm going to talk about graffiti in terms of resistance, for lack of a better term, in a traditional way, thinking about um, like Roberta's uh, way of thinking of it also as the political resistance, um, resistance to mainstream policy and that kind of thing. And then if we take it to a different level, we can talk about graffiti in terms of resistance to the mainstream um, art world or the pattern or the typical path of the career of the artist. Um, so that's taking it in a little bit of a different direction and I hope you guys can follow me there. And then I'll give you an example from some of the recent work um, in New York. So if we, if we think of resistance in terms of uh, resisting politically or um, resisting policy and that kind of thing, we can think of graffiti um, in that way, it's sort of a basic way, it's sort of an obvious sense in, the, in that way. Traditionally in academia, graffiti has been covered by criminologists primarily, not a lot of sociologists cover graffiti in depth. Uh, one of the examples of criminologists that cover graffiti is Farrell in 1995, did a study with graffiti writers in Denver, Colorado, and he basically found that graffiti was a form of resistance for these people. The main activity, the main goal of the graffiti writers in this, in this study was really just anarchistic. They wanted to display their resistance to the mainstream, and that's what he found. Uh, Lapman in 1988 is in fact one of the only sociologists to cover graffiti kind of at all. Um, and he, he did an article in AJS in, in 88. And his work was situated in Brooklyn with a group of young teenage male graffiti writers. And most graffiti writers are male. Um, and he found two things. One is that uh, the main goal of graffiti writers was really to gain a reputation within their inner city social circles. And so they would go on the subways and write their name as many times as possible. And then they enjoyed this sort of reputation within their, their communities. Um, as being resistant enough to authority without having to do other more serious crimes. Okay, but the other thing that, that Lachman also found was that this is a temporary thing. So once you get your, your fame or your reputation within your neighborhood, you lose interest, you've got the reputation already, and you stop doing it. And so then as a result of that finding, he predicted that graffiti would die out by the end of the 1980s. Now as we see, it has not. Uh, I've seen a lot of graffiti actually around Sweden as I've been here. Um, and interestingly, just a side point, when I, I flew into Stockholm and they're actually having a street art exhibition at one of the museums there, um, opening in August. And so they've got banners all over the city with these tags on them, which I found was very really interesting. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but so he predicted that it would die out, and, and it really has not in many ways, um, and in fact has transitioned into commercial and fine art worlds. And so we can, we can think of art in terms of resistance in another way, if we move into that realm. And so the first way I want to talk about it is uh, as resistance to the typical path of the professional artist. Um, you know, that typical path involves going to art school, getting your MFA, showing at your MFA show. This is in terms of visual art. Gallery notices you at your MFA show, you become represented by that gallery, and then you get an audience, and then you get collectors. Um, with graffiti, the, the artists bypass all of that and go direct to the audience. Um, they're, they're just grabbing your attention whether you want them to or not. Um, and so we can talk about whether or not we think that some of the stuff that we see out there is, is aesthetically valuable. Um, but in terms of um, commercial and fine art situations, some people are finding it valuable. And so I want to give you an example of a person uh, who has kind of subverted that traditional path. And this, this piece that you see here is by a, a graffiti artist named Near One out of Los Angeles. And this is actually an example of the commercial appropriation of authenticity gained through resistance in, in the graffiti world. And so this guy, Near, has been a graffiti artist in Los Angeles for the last 20 years. Uh, started out doing typical tagging that you, that you would see anywhere on the streets and has evolved into doing huge oil canvases and, and things like that. Um, this is one of the pieces. It was, it was created for a project by Disney. They opened a Block 28 brand. It is a retail location at their Disneyland, um, it, at, the, at Disneyland in Southern California, and it's also a brand that they're targeting with uh, urban youth. You know, hey, we're fresh, we're Disney. Um, mm -hmm. So, so what Disney did when they opened this project is 
hired 10 graffiti artists from around the United States to produce artwork for t-shirts, posters, even throw pillows. I saw a pillow at, at Mir's house with this image on it. And that's actually how we got into the conversation. I was there interviewing him, and I was like, what, what the heck is that? You know. So he told me the story of this piece, and you can see Mickey is in the act of doing graffiti. He's painting his name, his, you know, his stamp, his, his face, all along this fence uh, in this urban environment. And the interesting piece about the story is that originally when Mir submitted the artwork to Disney, he was holding a spray can, a spray paint can. And Disney said, oh, no, 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 well, we, we want to benefit from the authenticity that you've gained through resistance, but we don't want to be closely connected with it. We want to be a couple of steps removed, so you need to change that to a bucket and a paintbrush, please. So, of course, he's getting paid a lot of money, and he did that. Um, but I find that very interesting because now the commercial appropriation of graffiti is ending up affecting the content itself. And that's probably um, fodder for a different panel discussion in itself. But um, So that's one way that resistance is becoming used in the art world.